What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we are here with Adam of Barry Tomorrow. It is great to be able to talk with you. Thanks for being here today, man. No worries, dude. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Anytime, man. Anytime. It's so awesome to have you here. Your last album, Cannibal, is one of the albums I definitely go back to as we remember the dismal days of lockdown. But now we got the follow-up <laughs> coming out very soon, The Seventh Son. Is this sort of like intended to just sort of be like a continuation or the sequel or just a follow-up to Cannibal? Or is this meant to sort of signify like a new beginning for Barry tomorrow? <clears throat> yeah, 100% a new beginning, man. I think obviously with everything that's gone on, um, with the lineup change that we made, I think, um, you know, this was really about us kind of pushing ourselves to the next step, you know, really thinking about what we wanted to do with the next album. Um, you know, I think fundamentally, if we hadn't made the change that we did, like we wouldn't, we wouldn't be making this record. So we approached it in a, in a different way. It was about expanding our sound. It was about staying true to what we are, but also, um, pushing ourselves even further um, and expanding on elements that we were um, looking to explore more, I guess, you know, utilizing Tom and Ed, the guys that have come into the band, utilizing their um, abilities as well and using their influences in the way that they write and create. So, yeah, we feel like it was, um, it was about just elevating everything. You know, we wanted to come back strong. Um, obviously, Cannibal did great. So it's a, it's a hard act to follow, but, you know, um, we we were pretty confident early doors based on you know the demos that we had that we had something special and yeah we're just, we're super proud of the album ultimately so yeah it's definitely an awesome album I had the privilege of hearing it now but for people who haven't heard the full length album yet do you feel like the singles that we heard so far such as Begin Again Bolt Cutter Abandon Us as well as uh, the track featuring Laws Taylor uh, Heretic is a good representation of what this whole album is going to sound like or is that just scratching the surface of what the seventh son is going to sound like yeah i think it's um it's a fairly decent representation but i think there's still a lot more to come which is cool i suppose it's always um always with the singles that we release um we try and give a range of options you know your your really heavy stuff you kind of in between and maybe explore the more melodic side you know we've we've always been the sort of band where we have, um, you know, differing um, elements on our records, be it the really heavy or the really melodic. So it's important to us to explore that. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some stuff on there um, that is pushing those boundaries even further that hasn't that hasn't been uh, released yet. So there's still there's still plenty more um, to come for the people who you know want to check out the record and are excited by the singles which it seems like most people are it's, the reaction has been you know insane which which is great yeah well what i've always loved about barry tomorrow is despite you know being labeled in the sort of like metalcore uh category i always found it a pretty uh remarkable and how you're always able to shock people like uh off of black flame for example i think peacekeeper is one of the best endings to any like metalcore album ever <laughs> just the chorus that goes in there and the way that it goes into it like crazy it's just yeah, a really man. epic final track do you enter the album with like uh the making of an album with like a preconceived vision or any forethought or is your songwriting process very like experimental and rather improvisational i think um i think we have an idea especially doors who you know generally is is the first one to kind of bring um you know guitar parts to the table um he'll kind of have i guess in his head ideas for the the types of songs that he might want to write you know there might be particular riff ideas that he wants to base it around he might just you know might be really generic, you know, he wants a, a, this is a fast circle pit song, or this is like the festival anthem, or, you know, those kinds of generic things, and it kind of, it gets built from there, but I think with this album, like, without doubt, we worked harder on this record than we've worked on any other album. Like, it was, it was, you know, written, demoed, um, recorded, ripped apart, you know, we, we went over it so many times. Um, before taking it to our producer Dan Weather, Dan Weller, sorry, but then afterwards as well. Um, once he got involved, like there, you know, there was further changes to be made. Um, we were changing things all the time in the studio. I think there's a lot, um, a lot more electronic elements on the record. So what I would say with this album that differs from all the others, like the amount of layers on this album, um, 
it's it's insane the amount of stuff that's on there so um what i like about it personally the most is almost on every listen once you get over the initial like you know hearing the vocals kind of straight away you start to hear different bits of the music like come out on all those different layers and um, it's got so much more depth than um in, a, in my opinion in our opinion i guess than any of our other albums have for that for that reason so it was kind of just um approaching it knowing that we wanted to push ourselves we wanted to push boundaries as i said before um and then just kind of organically letting that record develop but with um it's just such a collaborative process you know all six members have got ideas and opinions you know not just about their own instrument but about everything else and then you know as i said bringing the producer on board as well just he really gets us he's worked with us a lot before so he brings a lot to the table when it comes to songwriting too so it was just allowing the songs to sort of flourish but then equally what's always a challenge is knowing when to stop because obviously you can keep making changes to songs as long as you want the job's never really done but knowing when something is is good enough and and ready to go um so it was a, it was a very intense process but it was ultimately really fun um and obviously we we feel like we've ended up with a, a great record which we're excited about so it's it's all worth it at the end of the day yeah well i mean you know as a big fan of Barry Tomorrow when you compare portraits to the Union of Crowns to you know records such as Earthbound or Black Flame I mean you could tell what song would be off of which album in a way so it almost seems like every album has sort of signified like its own unique approach it's not like you're sort of like it's not like with this album you were necessarily looking back at Cannibal being like okay let's bring this in here and let's abandon that you just kind of look forward rather than looking back no. right? yeah exactly but I think um you know, to be honest, obviously Cannibal did great. As I said, it, it was a it was a very weird period in time for us as a band, but also for the world. As you as you mentioned before, when it comes to the pandemic, you know, it was all unprecedented. So I suppose for us, looking back at Cannibal, um, there's a lot of negatives. There's a lot of weirdness. Um, the cycle was obviously essentially non-existent from a touring perspective and, and obviously when we did come back to touring our band looked very different than it did before so I think you know this was this was definitely not an album where we were looking at Cannibal and thinking you know how do we how do we follow on from that how does it link with that it was very much about writing a, a standalone piece that reflected where Buried Tomorrow was at now and you know more than looking at Cannibal we were kind of looking at the life and death singles that we did you know the first ones that we came back with the new lineup for and kind of looking at those um, and building on on those tracks essentially for the new record it was it was very much this is a, a new era um, you know the past is the past and let's let's see what we can do next um, as the drummer of Buried Tomorrow um, have you always preferred to have music present before you sort of like knew how to lay down your parts and how to incorporate the drums into it? Or have you ever had like a whole pattern written that maybe the band could write over? Uh, so we generally start with guitars, as I mentioned before. Um, there's not been, I think across our kind of albums, there's been a couple of times where I've had ideas of particular fills or types of beats that I wanted to incorporate and it's kind of looking for an opportunity you know where those would work once you start hearing music um, we generally start with, with the guitar parts um, and tend to what we try and do initially is not go too complex obviously I'm sure you've heard guitarists have a tendency to write pretty crazy drum patterns mm -hmm. um so we always have to tone that down a little bit but we're quite we're really keen when it comes to the drums and bt so like we want to link what i'm doing and the kick patterns especially we want to feel like it locks with the riff so we spend a lot of time uh between us and then again with with our producer making sure that what i'm playing and the kick patterns are kind of accentuating what the guitar is doing in in riff moments um, and that can that can lead to some fairly um, you know, kind of unique and different pedal patterns as opposed to it being quite standard all the way through. Um, but what we did with this album that was really different, and I suppose it's kind of cool to be you know seven albums in and still experiencing new stuff in the studio. We actually tracked the drums right at the end of the record, so we'd 
programmed all the drums as you know everyone kind of does demo wise and ultimately the album had been tracked to um program drums that had some had had a lot of thought go into them so they were more or less what we wanted but it gave the guys something to track to but the idea was because we knew that the record was always going to develop um as everyone lays down their stuff and we knew it would change so much organically um and it's kind of crazy it's the first time we've ever done it but it makes so much sense we actually wanted to wait to all, for all the music to get fully confirmed before i then actually lay down the drum parts because once you lay down the drums first that's kind of it's it's committed obviously you can make changes and and do different bits with studio magic these days but it's like you're kind of it's set in stone yeah. yeah so then you know the the guitar parts kind of have to stay as they are and yes you can cut bits and pieces but it just meant that when i when i then went to track yes things had changed completely from when we first like wrote them um but it meant that i was able to you know maybe incorporate some slightly different drum elements which linked better to the new stuff that had been written as opposed to you know some of the older stuff before the songs had changed so that was a really unique experience um and generally a really positive one because i was able to get a much better understanding of the song before having to track drums for it because again when you do it first you know those demos have potentially only just been completed so you really don't know the song very well when you're going to record it so by flipping that around it's something our producer had done for a couple of bands and it worked well so he you know he asked if we wanted to try it and you know as part of this being a whole like new kind of era i was like you know let's let's give it a go but it actually made a lot of sense um and so that was different this time so i, I think you know i can hear that in some of the parts um and some of the parts would have been very different if we hadn't have um done it that way around so that, that was kind of cool well not to talk shit and you know not to discredit you know uh dan, dan daniel and david and everybody else in the band but you know when you were laying down the drums to pass how off time was it before you started putting the drums on there <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fine. It was fine. We had um, everything laid down, uh, you know, to a click, and the, the program drums that we put on there. So it was, uh, it was good. And that's the other thing as well. Like, um, you know, when you track drums first, you've maybe got like a, a demo guitar track to track your drums to, you know, or like a scratch guitar to track to. Whereas this time, I had like the full song that I was tracking drums to. So it's like a it's a better experience for me as well because what I'm tracking to is like a, is a better sounding track if that makes sense. Um, so it, it was it worked out um, for everyone really. I, I think it's probably something that we will do in the future as well. You know, um, because like uh, I buried tomorrow has like a very eclectic sound in a way, especially I think most noticeably like the first you know eclectic sound that they would hear is you know the diversity in the vocals. How you know you have very clean parts but also some of the most aggressive parts so depending on like how clean the song is or how heavy the song is do you almost have to like adjust your techniques like i'm not a drummer so i could be like talking out of my ass right now but like do you would you say like for a clean chorus you have to like hit the ride symbol a lot more and like sustain certain parts as opposed to like you know a song like peacekeeper that i keep coming back to where it's like just full on in your face yeah yeah sometimes we like to think about you know we think carefully about what what symbols are being hit when? Um, yeah, I'm very conscious of not kind of spending too long on the same um, symbol, for example. So you know, it could be really easy for you to have like you know your your verses going into your chorus, back into your verses, and you're still on like you're still on your crash, for example, or still on your ride. You know that would be really easy to do. So we're very keen myself and Dan the producer to make sure that each of the parts drum wise have like their own kind of identity obviously there's going to be different kick patterns going on um, but just moving around the kit you know between hi-hats between your ride um, crash utilizing the china um, you know there's some um, bell parts in this album which I, I don't normally use too much to be honest um, but there's some um, pans using the ride bell which is kind of cool and something that i've never really done before so we try and make each individual section have their identity so that if you listen to them in isolation like you would notice the, the differences between it um but yeah we've always been fairly conscious of um 
you know, utilizing what I've got on the kit. But yeah, again, you know, tracking a softer song, you're not looking for that, you know, snare to sound like a cannon every time, you know, then you need to have dynamics throughout the track. So yeah, it's definitely a conscious thing for us, but you know, the, the vast majority of our stuff is heavy enough for me to be generally hitting everything really hard, which is kind of my <laughs> speciality, to be honest. Mm. The dynamics are part of my playing that, um, it's definitely not my forte, but it's kind of interesting to get into it a little bit more. And um, there's certainly a few um, pieces on on this new album where I needed to utilize dynamics a bit more than I maybe have done in the past. A lot of people like have said that like because drums aren't very melodic driven, and you know like it's not like a guitar solo or a vocal melody that there's not a lot of emotion that's channeled into the drums, and that it's just very solely technique based. But from watching constant drum playthroughs and seeing so many drummers just kill it live, I think that that's total BS. I think it's fair to say that when I'm listening to a Barry Tomorrow song and I hear those drums, there's a lot of emotional energy and a lot of uh, your own personal feeling that's channeled into it as well, right? Yeah, man. I think, to be honest with you, it can be really difficult to get that across um, on record. I do feel like a lot of that comes from a, a live setting and I think that's why live music is is so important and I think um, one of the reasons why you know we've always had a reputation to be honest with you as being a really solid live band there's plenty of people that have commented over the years that you know they prefer us live to on CD which to be honest I'll take that any day you know I'd rather be better live than, um, than on record but um, you know, obviously, I want them to like the, the recorded tracks as well. But I think it's because as a band, when people see us live, I think they can see the connection that we have with the songs. They can get that intensity from the performance. Um, you know, we, we're not the sort of band that goes on stage and just, you know, stands there and looks bored and walks off you know there's always been like you know movement on stage and that energy has always been a big part of our music and i think people feed off that so when it comes to drummers i think sometimes you know you can get incredibly technically gifted drummers that ultimately do look a little bit boring when they're playing what they're playing it might be that you know it's physically impossible for them to uh move any more than they are but you know i think sometimes for me, like the drummers that I like most um, are obviously gifted musicians, but they're also guys that make the simplest thing look cool while playing it. They look like they're having fun. You know, they look like they're hitting hard and enjoying themselves. Like I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of any musician, drumming or guitarist or whatever, where it's very static and they look bored. Um, you know, no disrespect to anyone that kind of does or digs that thing, but for us. It's always been about that live energy. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes the challenge with a studio recording is to to be able to get that energy across in in the recording and in the mix. Um, Not with you guys. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> Not with you yeah, guys. Yeah, and I think with this one, you know, we have, we've got that. There is an energy in the record, uh, which I think people can hear in the way it's been recorded and mixed. And, and the guys we worked with did a great job on that. But, um, yeah, the main thing for me is... You know, I want people come to come out to a show and, and really feel the intensity, you know? Yeah. Well, that led me perfectly into my next question. I have uh, two more questions for you. Um, One of them is pertaining to the live Barry Tomorrow show. I am so excited uh, to see you guys on the North American tour. I'm actually, I live four blocks away from uh, the Gramercy Theater that you're playing at. So uh, it's going to be amazing. A, man, awesome. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. Um, it just is there a similar energy that you put into your live presence as you do when you're songwriting because i know like in the studio it's like a very confined more static sort of environment and you know there's a lot of takes that you have to do and you know a lot of expensive equipment that you can't exactly crowd kill in front of so like uh is there at all though yeah. anything that ties playing live and songwriting together or are they two completely separate forms of of self-expression and what else can we be expecting from for like myself this is going to be our for a lot of people their first time in North America experiencing Barry tomorrow yeah I don't know man I just think when we get on stage like that's that's our bread and butter that's where we've cut our teeth that's what we've been doing for so many years you know that's where we feel most comfortable and to be honest I back our band on the live stage you know any day of the week to to impress people it's just it's just kind of what we do I think we're we know what we're doing. We've been doing it for a long time, but we just genuinely get on stage and have a good time. Um, 
and we we tend to be really good and this is you know credit to to Dan especially as a front man you know I think he's one of the best at getting the crowd engaged um, and I think that's uh that's an art form in itself I don't think everyone has that um, and Dan has always been really really good at that um, so you know always feels that very quickly whether the crowd know who we are or not um, you know he kind of has them in the palm of his hand and then he's just you know he's the conductor throughout the set of the, of the show you know um, because it's important for us that the crowd has a good time you know there's as a band to be honest with you there's nothing more disconcerting with getting on stage going really hard and like a crowd just looking bored back at you like that's the weirdest experience so you know for us it's super important that we get the crowd involved that they have a good time um and yeah you know nine times out of ten we're, we're very fortunate we play to incredible crowds so i think it is a very different energy i think we approach our songwriting um you know when we're writing songs we're 100 percent thinking about all oh, you know how would this be live you know um I think it's really important because some songs don't translate as well live. Sometimes you write them, you think they're going to be better live than they are. Um, but I think sometimes you can you can tell before you finish a song, like, that's going to be a great live track. And I think we try and write all of our songs um, in the hope that, you know, we think they will be good live songs because I think it's important. Um, so it's always a consideration when we're writing and recording. Um, but yeah, I just think, you know, when people watch Bury Tomorrow, they see a band who hopefully they think, uh, you know, good at what they do, but they're, they're going to see a band that's, you know, that's having fun on stage, um, that really respects people that are willing to give them their time by watching and ultimately just want people to have a good time in, in watching us. So. Yeah, hopefully you notice that when when you see us in May. Yeah, I, I, I just I, I keep mentioning it. I I know like you being that this is for a lot of people the first U.S. tour. There's gonna be a lot of deep cuts that we, we want to hear off of like uh off of like uh portraits or or off of uh, the <coughs> Union of Crowns or something like that. For me, Peacekeeper is my requested song. I hope that's uh gonna be experienced live uh because that I think is gonna be a great live track. I could just see the crowd fucking throwing down during that track. Yeah, man, we did um, we did Black Flame in full um, in the UK and Europe um, just before the pandemic hit. Um, we did a, a headliner where that was what we did each night. So that was cool. It was a good experience. It's not something we'd done before. Um, but yeah, you know, we're still finalizing the set. You know, I think it is difficult. Obviously, we want to we want to push the new stuff. I think there's you know, there is an added complication because we've changed the lineup. Um, we don't want to revisit too much old stuff, but we've definitely discussed playing um, older stuff when we go out to the States because we're so aware you guys just haven't had the chance to see us, um, and we respect that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what ends up being on the set list, but, you know, regardless, we'll make sure that everyone has a good time. Definitely. And the final question I wanted to ask is, is um, and kind of like the silliest question for last, but got to ask it, um, is that Barry Tomorrow has always been characterized in the sort of metalcore movement and i've always said that metalcore is sort of like the greatest export of britain because think about it like what are the other metalcore capitals outside of the uk australia and massachusetts so i've always so i think in the end i think it is sort of like a uk sort of a uh, thing uh, behind there but what would you define as like metalcore people say it's like a bridge between hardcore and metal but like i see a lot of elements outside of just those two genres in the style of both barrier tomorrow and other metalcore bands so what would make something a yeah. metalcore band dude that i mean that's it's difficult i think as you've kind of touched on everyone sort of has a uh, bit of a different opinion i guess depends who you speak to um for me it's always been um obviously having a metallic edge but having that the mix of the heavy and the melodic um i've always kind of associated metalcore with bands that i guess you know sing and scream uh, you can definitely have metalcore bands that that don't sing um you know we were huge fans of um unearth when we were like kind of coming through um and, you know, I guess they would potentially be in metalcore genre to some people. Other people would just say it's metal. But I think where they had so much melody within the um, guitar parts, I think sometimes that 
that's also a huge feature of, of metalcore. You know, even if you've got um, really kind of aggressive vocal styles, you've got a lot of melody within the riffs where they're almost singing to you. You know, that's a big feature for me. Um, but yeah, generally, my, my own views on metalcore are kind of, you know, singing, screaming, heavy melodic, lots of riffs, breakdowns. Um, but, you know, trying to have these kind of anthemic um, song moments as well. Um, I guess that's that's what it's always been to me. But to be honest, it's it's so broad now. You know, anything can kind of be called metalcore. I mean, I've lost track a little bit, but we've never shied away from it. There's a lot of people, you know, certainly a few years ago where it was sort of this this dirty word, or metalcore, it's, it's, you know, watered down metal, whatever it is. But, you know, I, I ultimately, if, if people want to call some of our old favorite bands metalcore and that's what we sound like, then I'm happy. If they want to call us a metal band, that's cool. Um, we don't really mind um, so long as people like the music. Um, but yeah, it's it's always just been about a mixture of heavy and melodic for me, and that's kind of as far as it goes. Yeah, because like you know, Kill Switch Engage and Shadows Fall has a very different sound from a band like While She Sleeps or a band like. Uh, parkway drive has a lot of differences from a band like um on earth for example as you mentioned before so like there is a lot of exactly differences. exactly so I, I think that's why it's so difficult like, ultimately they're such different bands but te- you know some people would say we're all part of the same genre you know you've got bands in there who are singing a lot and you've got bands in there who never sing a note so but yeah we're, we're apparently within the same genre so i think it's really open to interpretation but i suppose that's where the you know, having so much melody within the, the music comes in and people think about it less about what the vocals are doing and more about what the music's doing, um, which is, you know, absolutely relevant. So, yeah, ultimately, as I said, I'm happy to be in the same ballpark as those other incredible bands. Um, so long as people like the music, you know, I don't care. We're not looking to be called a, a metal band. We're not looking to be called a metalcore band. We're just we're a heavy band um and you know we hope people like it that's that's about as far as it goes really but there, there's just so many different bands that sound unbelievably different that apparently in the same genre it can get a little bit confusing definitely definitely but again i think you know it's one of britain's greatest exports with australia massachusetts i think south africa and india are going to be the next uh metalcore capitals <laughs> of the world but uh I want to thank you. you. Reckon? <laughs> yeah, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, truly appreciate it, everybody. We are here with Barry tomorrow, the Seventh Sun, coming out this uh, March thirty first. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. <laughs>